and uh, I was thinking, what better way to worship Shiva than to, you know, sing the glories of of Shiva in praise of Shiva, and what better way to praise Shiva uh, than through the Shiva Mahimna Stotra, the probably the most beloved, most well known, and most magnificent uh, hymn, Sanskrit hymn. Uh, for Shiva. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, it's something that's recited by millions of people, by Hindus uh, in India and elsewhere, every day. Um, monks who, as a rule, do not frequent temples and uh, you know, do ritualistic worship, but they worship Shiva. Shiva is the god of the, for, the, for the monks. And uh, um, it was all about studying non-dual Vedanta. But one thing was compulsory that you have to go in the morning to the temple and it's the temple of Shiva, Abhinava Chandraeshwara. So you have to go to the temple and attend the morning meditation and that culminates with a chanting of this hymn, uh, the Shiva Mahimna Stotra and so on. And this is something that is chanted by people at, in their homes, temples, the Shiva temples across India and also across the world now. So I'll uh, talk about this. Of course, I cannot go through the entire uh, hymn, there's so many verses, a few of them, the uh, initial ones. Um, it's also storytelling because it's full of uh, the most charming s- stories. How do you deal with these stories? How do you, you know, um, get maximum benefit from these stories? These are Puranic, the legends. These are always true because they are not about historical fact, they're ab- about spiritual truths. So those are always true for all times, for all peoples. So Vivekananda, in one place, he talks about uh, how you, how do you deal with these stories? He says, don't uh, scrutinize them for which one is t- true, because you will find the same story with multiple versions, and all of them are true because they are meant to show us something, not to tell us about a particular historical event. They don't look at it, scrutinize it historically, don't scrutinize it scientifically, uh, but. He gives a beautiful analogy. It's like water washing over you. Let it wash over you. Listen to it, you know, with reverentially. Let it wash over you and f- let the flood waters recede. It will leave behind, he says, it will leave behind in you a nugget of truth. It will leave behind some intuitive understanding which is difficult to put in language, but you will get it. So that's how you deal with these stories. I'll chant the um, verses and talk about it a little bit. So it starts like this. Mahim na param te param vidusho yadya sadrishi athavachya sarva swamati parinama vadhigrinan mama pyesha stotre haranirapavada parikara What does this mean? He starts off by saying, if praising thee, O Lord Shiva, if praising thee um, by one, someone who is ignorant of thy greatness, it's unbecoming. Um, In that case, even the praises of Brahma and all the other gods, they are inadequate because they also do not know your glory, the full extent of your glory. And if it is all all right, not blameworthy, if someone praises thee according to their according to their powers you know whatever their capacity is in that case it's all right then in that case even this um, humble offering which i am composing this is also without blemish so it starts off on a very uh, humble tone that um, even the gods they, they cannot praise you see when you praise somebody or something that depends upon knowledge one must know what one is praising but then it becomes that becomes a difficult um, um, condition because when it comes to God, who knows God? Uh, who knows the extent of the magnificence and the greatness of God? In that case, who is qualified to praise God? Swami Vivekananda, once he was asked, "Why don't you write a biography? You know Sri Ramakrishna more than better than anybody else. Why don't you write a biography of Sri Ramakrishna?" And he replied in a in a Bengali phrase. He says, "Sheep goat teki banor goat bo." When you, um, you know, it was the ha- a, a practice to make clay images of Shiva and worship. So sometimes, if the person who's making the image is not a good craftsman, or maybe a child, 
So instead of looking like Shiva, it looks like a monkey. So, <laughs> so the phrase goes, the Bengali saying goes that, um, you know, you start off trying to make an image of Shiva and you end up with a monkey. So <laughs> Vivekananda said that, uh, you know, when he was asked, why don't you write a biography of Sri Ramakrishna? He says, I'm going to you know, I start off writing, you know, making an image of Shiva and end up with a monkey. That means I... I cannot. I mean, whatever, even the best effort that I put forth is nowhere close to the you, that ultimate reality. So there are so many auspicious, wonderful, infinite qualities of God. Who is capable of mentioning all of that? In either case, God beyond attributes, the absolute reality, or God with attributes, it's impossible for um, anyone to you know, adequately praise God. So that's what he's saying. That avidusha, those who do not know, they will, uh, if they try to describe you as Adrishi, it will not be like you, what you truly are. It will not be an adequate description. And who can know you? Uh, who can know you, O oh Shiva? So there's a story, yes, another story about this. Who can know Shiva? So when the universe was created, you know the story that uh, Vishnu is always a couch potato. He's lying on this, this uh, cosmic serpent. And from his navel comes the lotus which blooms and on which Brahma, the creator, uh, out of the grace of Shiva himself. So that's the story. So in uh, popular iconography, in Hindu iconography, you will see Vishnu reclining. And on the from the navel of Vishnu, there's a lotus blooming. And on that, Brahma is sitting, who will proceed to create the universe. So Brahma creates the universe and then he happens to look down and sees Vishnu and says, who are you? And Vishnu says, I am your creator. Brahma said, I created the universe. You are my creator? What do you mean you are my creator? You are nobody. And so they start quarreling about who is greater, Vishnu or Brahma. And the gods become scared of this quarrel between Vishnu and Brahma. So they appeal to Shiva, do settle this quarrel. And then um, Shiva appears furious. He says, you keep quiet. You will destroy all theology. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shiva appears uh, before them in uh, a pillar of radiance or light or fire, which stresses, uh, which stretches from one end of the universe to the other end. So this is a very popular story. So this is this tower of light stretching from one end, um, from the top to the bottom. There's a top of the universe and the bottom. And the pillar of fire extended all the way up and all the way down. And whoever sees the top and the bottom of this pillar of fire, pillar of radiance, they are greater. They, they, they are greater. It's either Vishnu or Brahma. Brahma says, okay, I accept the challenge. And he's Rajasik, you know, he's the creator of the universe, dynamic. And his mount is the swan. He, he rides on the swan. So he goes on the swan and he says, I will uh, go to the, I'll fly to the top of the universe and find, find out the upper limit of this pillar of fire. Um, Vishnu is, he says, all right, I will dive down and go to the bottom of, uh, get to the bottom of this. What is this pillar of fire and what is its extent? So he takes the form of the Varaha, the boar, the cosmic boar, the avatars are there. So, so he dives, he goes shooting downwards and Brahma flies upwards, flapping up and on his swan. He travels and travels and travels and years and years pass. And neither comes to the end of this endless pillar of, uh, of fire. Now Brahma is tired and his swan can't, probably can't take it anymore. And so <laughs> Brahma thinks, what do I do? If I go back and supposing Vishnu has found the bottom of this thing and then he will you know, lord it over me and he'll say, I am greater than you. So he decides to lie. And uh, he, um, those who lie, they always get hold of witnesses. So he says, I'll have witnesses to back me up. And he gets hold of the sacred cow. And he tells the sacred cow that uh, you, you tell Vishnu that you were at the top of the, this Jyotir Linga, the Linga of, of, of fire, of light. And you were sprinkling it with your milk. Because you have to pour milk on the Shiva Linga. And then he gets hold of the Ketaki flower. It's a beautiful flower and tells the flower, you, uh, you give false witness and, you know, that you are on top of the Jyotirlinga. Because you put flowers on the uh, Shivalinga, flowers, leaves, uh, milk and water. So both of them said, all right, you are the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so they come back and Vishnu comes back. 
And Brahma says, well, did you find the bottom? Did you get to the bottom of this? And Vishnu says, I'm sorry, but I didn't. Uh, I couldn't find it. It's bottomless. Um, all these years of traveling and I couldn't get to the bottom of it. But Brahma says, I got to the top of it. And here are my witnesses. So if somebody's making a big claim and immediately produces witnesses, you know there's something fishy there. <laughs> here are the witnesses. The, and the cow said, yes, I was at the top of the, um, of the Jyotir Linga. And then the flower also said, yes, I was put on the top of this uh, pillar of fire. And then Shiva, his booming voice comes and says, Oh Brahma, shame on you. You are, you are charged with the creation of the worlds and you tell these lies. Um, so from now on, Vishnu will be worshipped uh, as I am worshipped. But nowhere in all the lands will you be worshipped. There's only one temple of Brahma. I think Pushkar is from there. Otherwise nobody worships Brahma. And then he um, told the sacred cow that fie on you for lying. And so from now on you will lick dirt with your tongue. <laughs> so... Uh, and the flower, Ketaki, and fie on you for lying. You will never be used for worship. And in fact, that's true. The Ketaki flower is not supposed to be used for worship of Shiva or for, for worship of the gods. In fact, this story about being unable, even Brahma and Vishnu being unable to find the limits of Shiva, uh, Pushpadanta mentions it in this uh, hymn. He says... Ah, this is the tenth verse in this hymn. I'm just skipping ahead to chant that. Tavaishvaryam yatnat yadu parivirin chir hari radha parichetum yatav analam analas kandhava pusha tato bhakti shraddha bhara guru grinad bhyam girishayat Swayam tasthe tabhyam tavaki manuvritir na phalati. O Girisha, O Shiva, Brahma, Brahma, who tried going high up, and Vishnu, who tried going down below, failed to measure thee. You had taken the form of a pillar of fire, of, a, uh, of an infinite pillar of fire. Afterwards, when they praise thee with great devotion and faith, you reveal yourself to them of thy own accord, showing that your worship never goes without result. So this is how he has put it. Anyway, the point being, uh, he says, even Brahma and others, uh, even their praise is not adequate because they cannot measure your uh, limits. So this is the, uh, the, the story is meant to show that. Another beautiful verse here, uh, which says that if um, you know your qualities, your auspicious qualities are without end, and if the goddess of learning, Saraswati, were to write about your qualities, and if the whole world were its, you know, the scroll on which it, uh, the goddess of learning writes, and if the blue mountain were the, the, you know powdered into ink, and the ocean were the ink pot. And the branch of the heavenly tree, Surataru, uh, the tree in the heavens, the branch where her pen, the quill, even then she would not come to the, uh, you know, it would not be adequate to write all of your qualities. A very beautiful verse. Um, Swami Vivekananda has quoted it once, uh, more than once. Swami Turiyananda, you find he writes, he say, he quotes this when he was asked to talk about Sri Ramakrishna. He says, uh, he quotes this verse. It's a famous verse. I'll jump ahead and just chant it because where he has almost come, finished the hymn and then he says it's not adequate. It's nowhere near adequate. He says, Asita giri samam syat kajjalam sindhu patram Surataru varashakha lekhani patram urvi Likhati yadi grihitva sarada sarvakalam tadapitava gunanamisha param nayati. O Lord Shiva, if the blue mountain were powdered into ink, you know, if the ocean were the ink pot, if the branch of the heavenly tree were the quill or the pen, and the earth the leaf on which it's written, and 
if the goddess of learning saraswati here called sarada if she were the one who was writing for eternity even then the limit of of thy virtues would not be reached so what to speak of my hum- humble effort at praising you it's full of wonderful uh, hymns like that do we have time for one yeah we have time for one more story it's a nice story so i'll just tell that story um so here puramatana means the one who destroyed the three cities there is a story of the tripura asura and the demon who dwelt in the three cities actually there were three demons but i won't go into that that's a long story again <laughs> so uh, at one time this tripura asura these demons or three demons they asked for a boon and they said all right in that case construct three invulnerable cities for us where we will stay uh, one uh, on earth made of iron one um, in the skies made of silver and one in deep space made of gold the three cities and we will stay there and nobody can destroy us and um, it's only uh, when all the three cities are together and that will happen once uh, for an instant in thousands of years at that moment only it it, uh, it can be destroyed and that too with if somebody can destroy all the cities with one arrow uh, then it can be destroyed something like that some very difficult conditions which means basically we'll be immortal nothing can be done to us so the this is how the three cities came to being and the demons lived there you know, one city on earth made of iron one city in the skies made of silver one city in the uh, in space made of gold again very symbolic i'll tell you what it means actually now the demons became incorrigible created havoc on the different worlds and any any time the gods or the humans start try to capture them they would re- retreat into their invulnerable cities and nobody could do anything to them and they captured so many uh, you know sentient beings and imprisoned them in these terrible cities finally the gods prayed to shiva to do something about these demons so shiva is a very dramatic description in fact pushpadant in this verse itself he gives a description how how shiva went and destroyed the cities and the gods gave all their weapons and equipment to shiva and uh, shiva goes up into the sky and you know there's this silver city does it remind you of a balloon floating in the sky somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and he shoots one arrow at it and the and the cities which had that moment they had uh, coincided you know they had, they came in in uh, in one line the three three of them were shot down you know, recently i think <laughs> the third one over canada yesterday so uh, all the cities were destroyed in an instant so shiva is also given the name puramathana uh, or tripurahara the one who destroyed the three cities um, there is I'll get, tell you the actual meaning, but there's a very beautiful verse here, which describes a dramatic verse, which describes yes, the eighteenth verse. Ushpadanta talks about this story. I'll chant it and then translate it for you. It's the destruction of the three cities. When you wanted to, thou you uh, you wanted to burn the three cities, which were like a piece of straw to you. Your chariot. earth the the earth itself became your chariot brahma was became your charioteer the great mountain meru was your bow the, your, your bow the sun and the moon were the wheels of your chariot wow, how dramatic you know the sun and the moon were the wheels of your chariot your arrow was none other than vishnu vishnu was the arrow and yet why all this paraphernalia why all this equipment you know so equipped with f22s and the missiles and it says you the lord you are not dependent on anything you are playing with these things it is it's it's your play it's your leela you could destroy the three cities if you wanted they exist at your whim and they are destroyed at your whim but it's part of your divine play all this drama of the of the planet earth being your chariot and the sun and the moon being the wheels of the chariot and brahma you know uh, driving this cosmic chariot and the meru being your bow and the vishnu being the arrow and so on and so forth and the three cities were pierced and destroyed and all beings were liberated that's the story um there is a tamil version of the story which i just read in english translation 
which goes takes this little further. It says, "You do not depend upon any of these. Actually, do you know how the cities were destroyed? When in the, you know, in the middle of this tremendous tumult of this cosmic battle going on, you smiled, you were amused, and the cities burnt were <laughs> reduced to ashes. You destroyed the three cities with a smile. There is. It's actually a Tamil verse." What does this mean? Is there any deeper meaning it's into it? The meaning is the seed, the causal state which we experience in deep sleep. In waking, we are on this city on earth, the iron city. In dreams, we are in the city in the sky, the silver city. And in deep sleep, the darkness of outer space, it's the golden city. It's the seed of our entire limited personality. Shiva, who is the fourth not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper. The fourth, Turiya, the consciousness. From that perspective, he shoots the arrow of knowledge, which pierces all three cities and showing us, liberating the sentient being trapped in these cities, showing us your real nature is pure consciousness, Shiva. So this is the meaning. Uh, uh, no? uh, amazing, the, these stories. This is what Vivekananda means when he says, let these stories sweep through you like water. And when the waters have receded, they'll leave a nugget of truth inside you, which is most valuable. I have. So Pushpadanta here says, Atad vyavrityayam chakitam abhidhatte shruti rapi. Shruti Upanishads. Vedas Upanishads. They designate, they talk about the ultimate reality, Brahman, you. In which way? Neti neti. Not this, not this. Not this, not this. And he says, Chakitam, scared, nervously. Even the highest spiritual texts, they nervously refer to you, you know, shakily refer to you as not this, not this. The only way, if you cannot directly refer to the ultimate reality, the way you can refer to the ultimate reality is by saying what it is not. I can't say what it is, but I can show, tell you what it is not. How does that work? Neti neti, not this. Which, this what? Whatever you can designate by this. So, this thing which I see, not. What I hear, not. Huh? Smell, taste, touch, not that. What I can speak about, not that. Whatever I can think about, not that. If you deny all of that, neti, not it, not that. Then what, you, what are you left with? A void, emptiness, doesn't exist, not that. <laughs> Neti, neti. The second neti refers to that. It is true that Brahman is here in every, every being, but you can't point to it directly. You have to negate. So this is the word used, atad vyavritya, which means the method of neti, neti, not this, not this. You have to deny that this is not Brahman. It's not that the ultimate reality is a table or a chair or a person or space or time. None of this then the immediate mistake will be, so that ultimate reality doesn't exist. And you have to say, not that either. <laughs> Another way the Keno Upanishad does it is, it's different from whatever you know, whatever anybody knows, that ultimate reality is different from it. Oh, so it's unknown. No, it's different from that too. Anya devatad vidita adato avidita adati. It is other than the known. Oh, so it's unknown. No. It's higher than the unknown, beyond the unknown. So he says, this is how the Upanishads, scared, nervously, refer to that ultimate reality. Or there is another way, as the God of this universe. You are the creator, preserver, destroyer of this universe, full of endless qualities. Even then it's difficult to refer to you because your qualities are endless. As we just said, the goddess of learning also cannot exhaust your qualities by writing about them. Next he says, Pade tu arvachine patati namana kasya navacha. The later forms that you assume for the sake of devotees, those attract our mind and speech. What is the later form? Which one? Uh, Ishwar in the form in which Shiva. There's a name Shiva, Maheshwara, Mahadeva. So there's a, he says, the form that you assume later, for the sake of the devotees, what is that form? On Mount Kailasha, 
you are sitting there dressed as a yogi with flowing matted locks and the moon on your forehead and the ganga flowing down your uh, lock, locks of hair and uh, your blue in hue seated in meditation with a third eye with a snake coiled around your uh, neck we are wearing a cloth of the tiger skin and things like that all the descriptions of shiva he says when you have this description then all of our minds and speech are attracted that which is beyond mind and speech because it's not an object that's the ultimate reality next that which is so infinite in uh, in auspicious qualities ishwara bhagwan the creator of this universe the one god of all religions and that is so infinite it you no praise can ever exhaust that can talk about it but now you have a further step down our real nature is shiva but we are imprisoned here we don't we don't we are stuck in this life shiva is the ultimate reality and we are all um pashu that means animals we are bound by maya pasha means maya the rope and the master of that rope is shiva uh, pashupati sri ramakrishna used to say pash baddhu jeev pash mukto shiv the same entity tied in the ropes is pashu the animal jeeva and tied and released from the bondage is shiva you are shiva in knowledge in ignorance tied in in this samsara you are jiva you can see the same story of the three cities and all so pashupati he says even, even that so basically what he says is those names and forms projected afterwards whose mind does not go there whose speech does not go there so that's why i am also composing this hymn he's still making a case for why he should compose the hymn then the next we are only on the third mantra <laughs> all right we'll just do that मधुस्पीतावाच परमृत निर्मितवत तव ब्रह्म किंवागि सुरगुरोस्मयपद मम ताणी गुणकथन पुण्यन भवत पुनाथे puramathan buddhir vyavasita so he says o brahman o shiva even the praise of brahman of brahma uh, it it falls short of thee who is the author of the nectar like vedas god not only creates the universe that's secondary god's great glory is that god gives the vedas god is the source of the vedas the vedas are even more important than the universe the vedas are eternal coexisting with ishvara and from cycle to cycle when the universe is created each time god gives out the vedas the vedas are the storehouse of spiritual knowledge which are core spiritual truths which come from god so those are the vedas you have given out this nectar like vedas so even the greatest of praise is you know small compared to what you have done pushpadanta became slightly vain he thought look i have composed the greatest hymn to shiva um, so this is my glory and immediately nandi the bull shiva's bull who's there uh, always with shiva nandi grinned at him and on the gleaming teeth of the bull he saw the entire hymn already written there <laughs> long before he composed it so that smashed his uh, ego you know that it's not by his own powers that he came up, uh, he was able to do this but uh, out of the grace of shiva himself these last two lines like as it all rivers flow into the ocean um, o lord all all men worship you in different ways the ruchi naam vai chitra because of different in difference in constitution and taste ruchi taste riju kutila nana patha yusham all these wonderful beloved most praised paths some are straight some are long and winding but what happens rinam eko gamya you are the one ultimate goal of all beings of all sentient beings just like then he gives a beautiful example payasam arnavaiva just as all the rivers flow into the ocean similarly all these paths flow into the you that ultimate reality where is this verse 
तव तत्व न जाना कीदृशोसी महेशर यादृशोसी महादेव तादृशाय नमो नम एट द वेरी एंड ऑफ दिस हिम पुष्पदंत सेज ट्रूली स्पीकिंग आई डू नॉट नो योर रियालिटी वॉट यू आर एंड वॉट यू आर लाइक आई डू नॉट नो आई डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड हु नोज वॉट एवर यू आर लाइक ओ ग्रेट गॉड महादेव माइ सैल्यूटेशन टू यू सो याद रिशोस एज यू आर वॉट एवर यू आर यू ओनली नो वॉट यू आर ओ महादेव तादृश आय नमो नम इन दैट फॉर्म नोन ओनली टू यू इन दैट रियालिटी माई सैल्यूटेशन अगेन एंड अगेन टू यू आई प्रे टू लॉर्ड शिव महादेव 